So good afternoon. So I'm Massimo Lamata. I'm computing technical coordinator for the Alice experiment. And uh, I will do, give you some, some flavors, some highlights of what we are doing. Uh, I could not resist to explain why we are doing this. So I will take a little bit of time in, uh, in going through what we are doing. So Alice is one of the four experiments based at uh, the major four experiments based on the LHC uh, Collider at CERN. In the picture, you can see the location. They are along a, a ring, which is, which is the LHC, which is 37 kilometers circumference, and uh, which is a collider. It means that it's capable to accelerate and let collide beams, particles, in certain areas. It, though, around those areas, we build the experiments. And uh, uh, so Alice is one of these. So you have uh, the, the here the aerial view of the of the area around Geneva. You can find you can see that, for example, the lake and the airport. What is an high energy physics experiment nowadays? Essentially, they they share among them very many of their let's say characteristics. Essentially, it's a it's a layer structure. Uh, a little bit like, like an onion, if you want. This is the interaction area, so beams are coming from this side and this side in order to cover as much as possible interaction um, area and to expose all the detectors to the products of the collision. I think for, the, for this talk, it's better to show you a picture. In this picture, you see the magnet, which has two huge doors which are open and inside part of the detectors being uh, serviced and being uh, used. These doors are closed normally during operations and to have an idea of the size, this is the part where, I mean, there is a person working on the, on the area which is then closed once the, the, the door is closed. So what does, well, what do, 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 does this experiment do? I mean, here there are how it behaves, it, it um, Couples itself to uh, collisions. These are real events, so real collisions. And uh, <clears throat> you see here, this is the view, let's say, from the beam side, so it's kind of transfer. And this is a, a side view. This is a more prospective. And these uh, lines, which are bent, are uh, tracks coming out from the interaction point. If this uh, looks to you already complex, I mean, there is a lot of, I mean, you understand how that there is a lot of data build uh, these, uh, these, these trucks. This is uh, actually a more common uh, event where there are collisions of, uh, um, of lead, lead ions. Being so, so heavy and so complex, very often the events are extremely crowded. So you, in this particular one, you can almost not see the detector any longer, which was, let's say, kind of transparent you see there. So all these data, as we speak now, are um, processed by an, uh, across a, a worldwide infrastructure. And this is the view for our experiment. So the dots you see are computer centers of different sizes. And they work, let's say, together in order to produce, to, to, to give to the experiment the, the computing power needed for, for its activity. Um, this is actually part of what we call WLCG. So worldwide LEC computing grid, which is an international collaboration which has built this um, infrastructure in order to support the high energy physics experiments. There is a there are let's say different levels of uh, centers. So CENT is zero because it's the one which receives data. Then regional centers and smaller centers uh, exceeding the, uh, to, uh, the, the number of 200. All these centers, in different ways, they produce, they uh, offer compute and storage services. Their workload can be seen essentially as a continuous flux of jobs, in the sense that we base our analysis, uh, our say, computing activities, on uh, using the file level polarism. So every collisions or group of collisions are effectively independent from the others, and the most effective way to do the processing essentially is distribute files and process them, let's say, one by one. Uh, there are three types of activities. Simulation, which we call Monte Carlo. Reconstruction, which is reconstructing from the detector readings to, to, uh, to quantities like tracks, trajectories, and other physical quantities. And then the analysis, which is what follows and which really leads to, um, let's say, 
to a really physics output. Um, this is the, the way we are using the system during the last few months. And you see that Alice is uh, essentially loading this distributed system with uh, um, of the order of 130,000 jobs at any moment in time across very many centers, the ones in the, in the previous picture, the one with the, with the small dots. Um, actually, there are different activities and they are, let's say, the, the internal dynamics is very complex. So there are, this is the overall envelope, but then you see that there are different colors. There is the simulation activities, there are the construction activities and analysis. This system has been built for LEC, I mean, from, from its name, WCG. On the other hand, can all, has also some applicability beyond, and uh, I picked up this one because during uh, uh, the recent uh, COVID-19 crisis, we were donating some percentage of our resources in order to, uh, to help this um, project, which is folding at, home, uh, folding at Home, essentially, which is looking for um, chemicals and uh, drugs which are active, could be active against, the, in this particular case, against this virus. So this is what we are doing now, I mean, as today, but how the, I mean, where are we in the, in the overall project? So um, the real first year of the data taking is back in 2011. And then we have years of data taking, alternating with interruptions like this one, LS1, and now we are in LS2. These long interruptions, like a couple of years, are needed for improving the machines, upgrading the machines, and also the experiment. And this time, during this break, Alice is going through a major upgrade. A major upgrade, which I will describe in a moment, and which has to do not so much with changes in energy. You see that we are already close to the nominal energy. We were running at 13 and will be at 13 and 14 tera electron volt after the, after the break. So we are essentially already there. But what will change is this uh, kind of cryptic um, unit, which is the luminosity of the machine. So the number of the quantity of data we can produce and as a detector digest. So the experiment, although looks similar, is being upgraded in many different parts. And there are two areas which I would, I, I, I would like just to mention. One is the inner detector, so it's a tracking detector, it's a detector which is sensitive to the position of the particles. It's a silicon, it's a silicon based detector, which has 12 billion channels alone. This is the largest LHC sub detector uh, across the, all, the detect, all, the, all the experiments. The other detector, which I will mention a couple of times in the, few, in the, in the next slides, is called TPC, stands for Time Projection Chamber. And this, is the, this will be the main producer of data during the next uh, round of, of physics starting uh, after this, uh, this break, after this upgrade period. But also a couple of pictures. This is the assembly of this uh, silicon detector. This is really the first layer of the onion I was mentioning before. So inside this uh, here is half a cylinder that will be the beam where the uh, the beams are, uh, sorry, the beam pipe where the beams are circulating and colliding at the center. The other one is this TPC, which I mentioned already, which is a huge cylinder, um, five meters diameter, five, roughly five meters also, also of height. And this is a field, it's essentially 90 uh, cubic meters of gas. And we will discuss I mean, a little bit how it works in a, in a moment. So, um, what is the after upgrade scenario? So we are entering what is called uh, round three. We are entering with new detectors, which at the same time can cope with higher interaction rates, so more collisions, and also they can produce uh, more precise information. And uh, so we expect that uh, we'll to operate at 50 kilohertz of collisions. All this will produce a lot of data and uh, actually, the the part of the let's say the part of the compute part, which is the one I will describe, has really the goal to keep this uh, um, increase of data a little bit under control. So it will be essentially at the end, essentially a tenfold increase compared to the previous run. 
Um, I mentioned a couple of times TPC. I think this is important because it is a detector which, as I said, produces most of the data and produces most of the data in a way that is really, really complex. Complex in the sense that every time a particle crosses this volume of gas, ionizes some, some, uh, some molecules of the gas, and electrons will start, be, uh, because of the, of the, of the potential, um, they will start drifting and arriving to the, to the real sensitive part, which is only at the end. Otherwise, it's a big volume of gas. So the, the, they land in a position which corresponds to the projection of the, of the, of the particle passing through, or so the, or the, or if you prefer, the original electron. The time of the, the drift time corresponds to, let's say, the third project, the third coordinate. The problem here is that in order to cope with the, with the, with the rate we have, this detector will work in a kind of continuous mode. So we will not take, say, pictures, start the clock, measure the, the, the drift time, but essentially we will accumulate signals continuously. So if you simply take snapshots, you will lose Typically, you will lose the, the event because you will have maybe the information on some fast detectors which are producing some information, but the information from the TPC is, let's say, is arriving a little bit later due to the relatively slow drift time. So instead of taking, say, pictures as it was customary in ionic physics, we are going to integrate over what we call time frames, long compared to the, let's say, to the drift time. Uh, which is essentially 10 milliseconds. So we are taking 10 milliseconds movies of what's going on in the detector, which is very nice, but of course creates the complexity of unfold what is going on in this movie and the reconstructed events. So this is a kind of more scary picture. Um, in the previous event, in the previous, um, so some slides ago, I showed a couple of events where there were collisions and tracks. In reality, in, the, in, uh, in round three, these tracks will be, from, a, from, a, from an acquisition point of view, overlapping to each other. And this is a kind of an image you have to make sense of. Here is a simulation, so it's pretty easy because colors helps you. In, uh, once we are taking data, we don't know if, uh, if, if a track, say, corresponds to the red part or the blue part, etc., etc. So this is really what the, gives the, comp the computing complexity to our system. So what does it mean in terms of data flow? So detector, the detector will produce, it will be essentially read in this continuous mode, producing uh, 3.5 terabyte per second. So this is, uh, these are bytes, not bits. Um, all these data are coming completely in parallel and entering a farm where the data are reduced are reduced uh, and uh, they are they will start the organization in these time frames. Uh, the reduction is essentially a factor of six, and after this factor of six reduction, we can start with the second stage, where these data are collected, processed, and the processing will um, yield a, another or will produce another factor of six roughly of data reduction, ending up with 100 gigabyte per second, and this is the the data which we are going to save on this. So this is uh, the same things in, in the kind of diagram. So the uh, the first part of the farm, this uh, first uh, first line processing, the uh, uh, first level processor farm is already existing, has been installed because it's essential also to uh, restart and uh, tune uh, all the detectors as they are becoming uh, being uh, switched on again after the upgrade. And what happens here, as I said, is this uh, first organization. There is a data reduction, but this comes essentially from uh, things like zero suppression. So reduction of known essential information. After that, as I said, we enter the EDN uh, farm. So the second farm, uh, I didn't say. So the first farm has 200 nodes. The second farm is still under a discussion, I mean, the, the exact layout. But we need, in order to do the processing, which is uh, the heavy part, is this unfolding of the, of the brief time I mentioned before, we need uh, of the order of uh, 1,500 to 2,000 modern GPUs. This will yield another factor of CIS compression, which is 
also obtained by keeping only the reconstructive quantities and the elements which are necessary to check the reconstructive quantities. So part of the data are, um, are reduced here. So there is a, there is a, it's a comprehension which is partly lost, uh, is not completely lost. Um, the, what we are, we are aiming to is, uh, so a farm which contains as, ma as many uh, GPUs organized as PCs holding between four and eight GPUs each. Okay, we probably skip the, the way we organize the, the, different, uh, the different workflows and I go back to the, to the block diagram and I will start concentrating on the uh, EOS part, on the, on, the, on the disk part. So what is EOS? EOS is a project which has been uh, started several years ago at CERN for, for storage to solve the LHC, again the LHC needs for storage. And its main ingredients are a very fast namespace, an adaptive distribution of data in the sense that you can decide which kind of, I mean, how the data are effectively physically stored on the, on the disk. So you can have the replications at different levels, you can have erasure coding, for example. And what is very important is that it has a large protocol of choice. During this year, as demonstrated flexibility and scalability, because it has been used for handling large repositories like the one I'm describing. Um, so in the 100 uh, of uh, petabytes range. But it's also backend for different things like a sync repository or the sandbox, like a bit like Dropbox, if you, if you like. It also provides uh, um, high system access via Fuse. It can also, it has been operated not any longer also in, in a way to have replicas in different computer centers, synchronized, but in different computer centers at uh, relatively high distance. In, uh, it was more than 1,000 kilometers and around 20 milliseconds um, um, latency between the two sides. What I think is very important is really something which organically grows from heterogeneous resources. So it's not something you you, you put there on the floor once and for all, but you can, as machines are getting either broken or obsolete, you replace them with uh, typically different machines which might have a little bit higher connectivity, uh, more disk or faster disk or whatever. And this is completely organic. So the system is in, a, in continuous evolution. As today, there are 300, more than 300 petabytes on the floor and Alice alone will use 70. So I have this picture just to, to, to show a bit, of, I, I like to, to show the physical layout of the, how the files are distributed. So these are representing different, <coughs> different machines with disks. And in the, the simplest case is replica two. So you have a file, for example, in this position, this position, uh, another one which is here and there, etc. So this is clearly very, very important once there are failures. And once you start having 10 to the order of 10 to the four disk, uh, Failures are, are continuous. You don't want, and you don't want to to have to react immediately to this kind of, this kind of failures. The the distribution of the data across the, the infrastructure is done in the way that, uh, for example, here you have a disk which goes uh, goes down. You lose access to the to the replica of two files in this example, this one and this one. But of course, the files are still available, although in a degraded mode, because there is a partner of this one here and a partner of this one here. What is more important is that, in addition, once you start uh, re-replicating the data, of course, you will not have a single machine to, 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 uh, to be put under stress in order to extract all the data and create the, the, sec the second replica, but you have essentially a, a very many, I mean, a very large number of sources for example, for, for the yellow file, this will be a source for this, and uh, for the, this one will be a source for this. Um, so this is just uh, the, the dashboard of the computer center, and these are the active transfer. This has been taken, I think, yesterday or the day before. So typically we sustain uh, between 70,000, I mean, an order of 100,000 um, uh, data transfers. Um, this is, let's say, during, during data taking, these numbers can go a little bit higher, but in reality, the, the amount of data we are dealing with is such, and that the number of analysis the physicists are, are doing is such that 
there is a, there is a, a, a is, is a, there is a visible effect, but we are not completely dominated by the, the data acquisition. This is another dashboard where you see that there are 300 petabytes. The number of files is relatively small because most of the capacity, most of the, what the, let's say the size is given by very large files, like I mean, more than uh, two gigabytes, like typically eight gigabyte files. But the system is also capable to serve very small files. A note about the hardware. This is a picture from the computer center. So the idea is, uh, this is the typical implementation. This is a quad server. Uh, and uh, in one of the uh, one of the um, of the node, we we quote hang um, the disks. They are typically organized in 24 disk uh, trays, and this is one possible uh, situation. So two HBAs chaining uh, um, two uh, two crates each. Um, if equipped with the 14 terabytes uh, disks, uh, this is a uh, 1.3 more or less uh, terabyte, uh, petabyte, uh, petabyte box. And to the picture uh, correspond to this. So this is the quarter of the hypervisor, and these are the four uh, disk trays. Depending on what you are doing, you can have also this for other disk trays, if you want a disk uh, uh, arm, which is what we are doing for Alice. In other cases, you mix S disk server with the three hypervisors if you want to essentially it's also a way to tune the way you you use your power budget once you, uh, you deploy the, the system in, the, in your computer center. Um, oops. I mentioned we okay, it's going forward by itself. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Importance of specialized client. I'm sorry, I have to go back uh, <laughs> continuously by hand for some reason. Ah. Um, okay, sorry. We hope it stays. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. So uh, the importance of clients is that uh, um, uh, for specialized in specialized areas, we really rely on having the maximum performance. So, for example, this is an example for Alice for the for writing of the data. So, on the left, you, is there? A, I'm sorry, is there a way to stop? Is is this kind of automatic? Uh, um, I will do like this. Sorry. Okay, so with the um, importance of specialized clients, so some special clients are really needed in order to uh, to take the ma get the maximum in terms of performance. This has some uh, possibly some uh, uh, affinity with something else which has been presented this morning. I think it was called NCP or something like this. So these are uh, equivalent of put and get of, uh, uh, command line ways to inject files. Here we are talking about writing into it. And uh, um, they can be tuned in order to have the, the, the best of, of a given application. So for example, at zero level, you decide if you want a certain layout. Here is replica 2 versus 10 plus 2. So the way it works is different, because in one case, the flag, essentially, you hit only two disks in the farm. In the other one, you with 10 plus 2, you hit 12 disks in the farm. But then there are also details on how this data distribution is done. It can be done server side, like here, or client side. So this, the client is smart enough to communicate, to create the, the different slides of the, of the replica, or the erasure coding, and then distribute it in, the, in one way. So this is, I think, unique of a system like this, in the sense that you are not bound to uh, one solution for all the, all the all your activities, but you can really uh, use the best for the, let's say, in particular time critical applications. I think maybe now I can continue with this. Let's see if it's stable. Um, there is something I I really would like to discuss a bit with you is about the the importance of POSIX, so the the fact that we have got a, a habit to POSIX, 
and also on the other hand, uh, very frequently we, de we decide to de de deviate a bit from, from this. So on one extreme is that uh, this, this system, which originally was only for, uh, for um, experimental data, is also mounted and uh, with, the, with a sizable user activity. So essentially of the order of 300 terabytes per week uh, read via these uh, fuse, uh, the fuse mount. So essentially people doing CP, uh, opening the files with the, with the Emacs, etc. So this is something which is very much uh, liked by the users. On the other hand, uh, the system has uh, as limit. I mean, is is difficult. Sometimes it's difficult to uh, effectively bend and uh, so, sorry, obey completely to POSIX in all in all areas. And there are areas which effectively deviating from from POSIX is uh, actually probably um, desirable. Uh, one example which I picked up here is about ACLs. So the ACLs which eventually we are using are inspired by the one of AFS. So with the with the breaking the ACL, um, sorry, the POSIX ACL protocol. So with this I would like to, to jump to conclusion and uh, so you that, okay, this farm, this uh, two-layer farm, which I mentioned, plus the, the storage is being installed in parallel with the entire experiment. On one side, of course, we will have uh, an exciting fusing program ahead. And in 2021, uh, this will be the initial year for the full system commission, which means detectors, but it, 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 uh, also computing chain and first collisions. Um, it's unclear uh, the details of 2021, again, due to the COVID uh, um, situation, and also had to be locked down for a couple of months. Uh, and then 2022-2024 uh, will be the three years of, the, of this uh, third phase of LEC data taking, which we call it country. Uh, for the storage, um, I think is, is an interesting uh, challenging scientific case. So clearly the many of the things we are doing and uh, the way we are implementing depends on the, on the scientific case. And I'm always hesitant if I have to say this is a specialized solution of a general interest because we have proofs that this has, has an interest also be, uh, beyond uh, um, high energy physics or is a general solution which is capable to cover specialized use cases. So thank you very much, and I would welcome questions or comments. Thanks a lot, uh, Massimo, uh, for this quite fascinating uh, presentation. So I have one question from Julian. Mm -hmm. So he's wondering if you have um, look at Ceph in order to address your uh, your problem. Yeah. Um, so I I do a little step back because uh, yeah. Um, I've got this, um, I'm working for Alice now for uh, for uh, more than one year. My previous job was the storage group. And in the storage group we had, uh, actually we introduced Ceph at CERN and we made uh, EOS, uh, let's say, starting uh, as a service. So essentially we decided to go in parallel. Uh, actually we started probably a little bit before with EOS and then we also got interested to Ceph and we went in parallel. So we are offering the two services. Uh, we are offering the two services for the, in, in different areas. In different areas, for example, our uh, OpenStack uh, facility is uh, powered, I would say, by, by Ceph. And there are more and more uh, use cases where we use Ceph to, to provide a, a viable service for our people. On the other hand, uh, EOS is the, is the one which uh, for the moment is best suited for the extremely large, let's say, data requirements. We are in contact also with the Ceph people, so there is really a collaboration or a uh, cross-fertilization, let's say, between the two systems. There are also versions of EOS which are using uh, Ceph in the, in the back end. For us, EOS has, a, has a clearly a strategic, uh, strategic potential which is, is coming from the fact that it would be completely under our control. So we are really shaping it every time there is a new challenging use case, we shape it 
the way we want, I would say. On the long term, I have no idea. Of course, this is a very active uh, um, area of development. So I think maybe in five years there will be other systems, uh, you know, the evolution of EOS, the evolution of SEP. On my side, I have one question also. Uh, considering the very uh, large capacities that you are uh, managing and also the, the throughput, do you have some um, uh, difficulties uh, to handle the areas of coding or the data protection? Sorry, data protection in terms of privacy? Yes, or areas of coding. Uh, in one of your slides, you mentioned. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Pardon me, yes. Uh, er erasure coding. So in one of your slides. Ah, erasure coding. Yes. So I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure I've understood the, the, the question. So erasure coding is. Uh, so Alice will be the, the first experiment or the first activity uh, using a massively erasure coding on EOS. The reason is that uh, this um, we cannot afford uh, a full replication. So, which will bring, uh, let's say, a, a, an overhead of the, of the order of 100%. We are considering most probably this uh, 10 plus 2, which is a 20% overhead. Um, the, the, the interest of erasure coding is also be, uh, of um, this system essentially receive files. So, uh, in case of, uh, of uh, without erasure coding, you are more or less limited but for a single stream activity by the speed of the disk. So the, the erasure coding is also a way to, to, to gain a little bit in single speed, uh, in single stream performance. We are not observing, let's say, the way we, uh, on our server, we are not observing a, a penalty which could really slow down the, the the, the transfer due to erasure coding. I would say, I would say the opposite. Okay, so thanks a lot. Let's thank our speaker. So I write clap in the chat.